You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we're heading back into the crappie world. You know, this is a, a really interesting uh, demographic of the fishing world, especially now when you look at the Bassmasters and pretty much so many tactics, trolling letters on your power poles, you know, a jigging minnow, forward fishing center. A lot of this stuff is crappie fishing first, and I really wanted to branch out and to do more in there, and that's where we're heading back to the Richmond Crappie Club, and we're going to be going through two different tournaments that just happened recently. And so I'll just let the, the, the winning couple take it away here, guys. Like h- how long have you been fishing together first? Cause I've fished with my significant other three times and we've only tried to kill each other twice. <laughs> uh, well, he's lucky that fishing takes place outside cause I like to be outside. So that, that is a benefit. Uh, I don't know since we, he used to be bigger Sorry. into hunting and then it transitioned to fishing, but it's been a long time over 10 years. Yeah, and we started yeah. dating in 2008, got engaged in 2012, and married in 2014, um, and pretty much been fishing the whole time. But uh, as I've gotten more serious, she's gotten more serious with my fishing too. <laughs> I'm a little competitive. She's very, well, she's more competitive than me. That is interesting to do it with your significant other like that, because again, like I'm trying to get uh, my wife more involved into like the Thursday nighters that start in the summertime where we're at. Did you guys always, like before you started to run your own organization, did you guys always like try to do some tournaments together or was it once, Josh, you started a club, then you guys started to compete together? It probably started with one of my buddies bailing on me. I didn't think that Faraday would be interested in tournament fishing. And one of my buddies, we set something up a couple months in advance. And then the night beforehand, he's like, hey, I I can't go. And then Faraday was like, well, I'll go with you. And we had a great time. So then after that, it was like, well, you, if you want to keep doing it, we can keep going. We can keep fishing, fishing some tournaments. And Yes, I would say I'm primarily the Richmond Crappy Club teammate, though, which is good <laughs> good balance for me because if it was much more, I don't think I could handle that. She's I a, do have a limit. She's a competitive <laughs> cyclist, so she's traveled a few places around the country and, yeah. and very competitive in the, the local and state level, and so she stays pretty busy with that well Farrah, what type of uh, a cycling do you do <laughs> mostly road racing so like crits and just road races longer road races and things along those lines it's it's been fun it's been good so for people that don't like understand that sport like how are you is it a mile is it a hundred like how many miles are you doing in a race uh it spans between based on time like an hour and how many laps you can do in an hour up to like 60 mile races probably is what mine typically goes to. So anywhere between an hour of racing to like under just under three hours of racing typically. Holy crap. So like where in the, where in the country have you gone for that? (laughs) Richmond is actually like a pretty big place for cycling, but I recently went to Tucson for it. Last weekend was in Maryland. We'll be in Maryland again next weekend, going to Pennsylvania, going to go to Vermont, going to go to Wisconsin. So it is my year of the bikes. And I had full permission to not go to the Richmond Crappy Club tournaments, but it's, uh, it's worked out with my schedule. So I've been there so far. I, yeah, th- this is not fishing related. This is interesting. How in the hell <laughs> do you get involved in that sport? It, it's cool, but it's not like yeah. something you see in college usually. Yeah. Very, very true. Uh, interesting thing. Not, I was doing triathlons. I had a lot of guy friends. He's very patient. Uh, but I wanted to find women who were more into what I'm into. Long hikes, long bike rides, things like that. So I found a community of cyclists, started just kind of riding in circles over at a local Richmond park. And then it kind of grew from there. So I can definitely see when you guys are saying like, you know, competition is something that's really just a part of, of who you are. So this is natural to go into like into tournament fishing when you're talking about triathlons or, or cycling it there is a mental stamina you need to do whether it is going in a circle a thousand times or you're running well how does that like transfer over to fishing where you know scope or no scope you're, you're sitting there waiting maybe for five bites or, or six moments throughout an eight-hour day i feel like last this past weekend was kind of like that where we were just getting strained and strained because it took all day to finally get the bag we wanted and we weren't getting that many fish it was just 
patients' repeated mm. performance. What do they want? How do they want to see it for this whole pass tournament on Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. Was, and, yeah. You know, on Sunday. And we, that was Chick, we, right? Yep. Chick how many Lake. Chick, yeah. Okay. Chick Lake. Yeah. That's what we had heard of a couple of boats that had a nine pounds, two different boats that had nine pounds earlier in the week pre fishing. And I knew one place to go that, that I felt like we could get that. And so we spent three hours there in the morning in, in that area. And at, after three hours, we had two fish. So we, we felt like we wanted pound and a quarter to pound and a third fish to win. But anything over a pound was a good crappy at Chick Lake. There's just not that many big fish. And uh, we, so after three hours, we had two fish. One was a pound and a quarter, and one was three quarters of a pound. And so then it's like, well, we got to make a move. And so we went back there later in the day, and we caught one more fish. We weighed in two fish from there. Yeah. But Fairydale has a, has a lot of patience when it comes when it comes to all that. So. And I bring snacks. Yeah. <laughs> I need to eat. He doesn't eat or drink almost the whole time, but I bring so many snacks for myself. So I can that, make that. That sounds like me. <laughs> the, the other thing, too, is to, to keep it fun. Like, sometimes with tournament fishing, it's easy to get too wrapped up in it, too serious. And it's a lot of fun with Fairdale just because I, I try to, like, reel myself back in a little bit. Like, the objective is to have fun, not always to win. <laughs> yes, and I think that's really hard. And I see this in a lot of small clubs that I help out with. And some people treat it like it's the Bassmaster Classic and you're winning $100,000. And it's like, dude, it's 50 bucks. Like, what the hell? Chill out. And that's the one thing I realized when I started to fish with my wife is like, she really helped ground me. It's like, why Why are we going to throw hands out on the water for a $20 side pot? This is stupid. Uh, probably need to hear that more often. <laughs> When it comes to Chick Lake, I've been I've I've had a couple of people on from the BFL bass side of things talking about Kerr and really how catching a four or five pound largemouth is a unicorn. If you can get that, that helps. When you're in a crappie lake like the Chick Lake, and from what you've what you've just said, where that extra caliber is so important, do you change how you practice to hunt for that bite? Chick Lake is unique. So if we go back to Lake Anna the objective there we, we felt like if we wanted to catch 100 fish we probably could but we wanted to target the bigger fish and so in that tournament we probably called 20 25 um but we, we've primarily focused on the day with trying to find those big fish and catching just the bigger ones chick lake's a lot different with this tournament we knew there would be some roaming fish but a lot of those roaming fish are, are harder to target and so we wanted to focus on brush piles. Now that the water's getting warmer, we felt like the fish would be on different types of wood. So if we just went from spot to spot and then you, you pull up to a brush pile and there might be six or seven fish and a couple of them might be bigger than the rest. And our objective was just to just see how many fish we could catch off that brush pile and hope we got lucky that the right ones would bite. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of a completely different aspect than Lake Anna where it's that's a small fish. We don't want it. That's a big one. That's the only one. And plus, I don't know how much this factors into it, but, you know, Lake Anna is clearly bigger than Chick Lake. So, and it's a clear, deeper body of water, generally speaking. How much do those factors play into it? Yeah, that's, that's huge. Because Lake Anna, we, we knew a handful of places that we could go to get away from the crowd, so to speak. And so most of the day there was maybe probably on average one other tournament boat within sight, but that was it. But Chickahominy Lake, it's, it's no secret to anybody that's fished there, crappy fish there, any of our tournaments. It's the upper end of the lake, like in the river system. It seems like that's where the bass guys run because they had a big bass tournament going on Saturday. And I think I saw one or two bass boats. But then once you get down out of the river system, well, I say out of the river system, out of where the current's really pulling, and you get to like around Eagles Landing from there down to the dam, that's where the water really starts to slow down. And it seems like that's where a lot of the crappy set up a, a lot easier to catch and you find more of the bigger fish. And so you really had, I bet there were probably 16 or 18 of our 19 boats fishing within two miles. Wow. So it, it's pretty crowded and that's where you have to change your style and finesse fish because people mm -hmm. are fishing some of the same brush piles. When you're dealing with those kind of crowds, like, and, and let's just go through, like, really let's just go through your day. I mean, you, you get there, how long are you staying in a spot? And then how often are you changing and cycling through baits? 
So in the morning, when we went to our first spot, we felt like if we can catch seven fish here, we can win it. So that's why we stayed there for three hours. Um, and one thing that worried me was pre-fishing the day before on Saturday, I ran around to a, probably 15, maybe 20 different spots, maybe, probably more. And normally I, I feel like Chickahominy Lake, I usually find eight to 10 areas or brush piles that have tournament fish. And this one I found four. Oof. So it was like, that's, that's all we have. We have four areas, they're pretty small areas. So it's like, well, it's, you know, it's what, an eight hour tournament. So we can commit two hours to each spot. So that was while we spent that extra hour at the first spot in the morning. And then after that, it was like, okay, let's run to a couple of other spots. And we spent a lot more time than like Lake Anna. We wouldn't have spent three hours in one area. We probably would have spent 30, 45 minutes and moved on. Yeah. We are always watching the clock and we set like time limits of what time we're going to leave. We're like, if we don't catch a fish that we want by this time, we're going on to the next spot. Cause he's always thinking about like the schedule of the day, how many spots there are to check out the risk versus reward of staying where we are. And it seemed most beneficial initially to stay that long at that one spot, but we set a time limit and nothing exciting was happening at that point. We moved on, which was a good that's, a, that's extremely viable to have that kind of discipline and build that in when you have a clear head, either, you know, the day before or, or in the morning. Could you explain, and I know that we're trying to bounce between different lakes. Is there a reason you want to spend less time at Lake Anna comparatively? Is it because it's bigger and there's more spots? Um, I would say the main thing was probably just because of the number of places we felt like we could go to find quality fish. Lake Anna, we had more areas and they were, we were targeting roaming fish. So when I'm saying an area, it, it, it may be a quarter mile in one area and it may be one mile in another area. So there was a lot of water to cover and Chickahominy Lake, the fish we were targeting were on brush or on some sort of wood. And so it was more spot specific and we just didn't have many places to go. So if, if it had reversed, if we were fishing Chickahominy Lake earlier and the fish were roaming, we'd probably, we'd be chasing the roaming fish in Lake Anna. It, it might, it, the roles might've reversed if the tournament times had reversed. How big is that going to Chick having that later in the year? Did that really affect their movements and where they were located? Yeah, I would say so. I'd say for the most part, in the wintertime, your fish are going to be roaming. They're going to be scattered. Um, and then as the water gets warmer, they'll start to get onto brush and docks and, and things like that. And then it's just in the fall, they'll start chasing bait more. Um, and then the, the depth of the water that you find, whether it's the main lake or backs of creeks, that'll change. Um but Chickahominy Lake, we've we we had it in April this year, in April last year, in March the year before. It seems like in March and April, it's a lot easier for everybody to catch fish all over the lake. So that's that's one thing we try to target with the schedule is we want people to be successful. So we try to figure out well, what's a good month where we feel like this lake will not just not always produce the quality, but produce the quantity where everybody has a good chance of catching a bunch of fish. Well, let's get into it then. All right. So, you know, you guys get up there, um, you get on Chick Lake. When did you feel like you started to figure something out? When did you get your first keeper? She, oh, she called it. Yeah, yeah. We got the first keeper kind of early, but I wouldn't say we figured it out until when was weigh in? <laughs> like 2 p.m. And weigh in was at 3 p.m. We were like, yeah. oh, we feel good now. But it literally took the whole time to feel good. We, we knew what weights people were catching pre fishing. It was literally slow collection of decent sized fish over a pound. Then we hit a point where they were literally almost all the same weight and it was getting kind of hard to call and swap them and uh, switch the fish. They were like all 1.1 and I was like, wait, this wow. one's 1.13, but now this one's 1.13 and just reweighing. But yeah, at, at Chick, it, it really took, it took the whole day, I feel like, to feel comfortable for me. Yeah. How many yeah, fish are you calling through? A lot. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a lot. It was just when they come, when we started getting them, they all ended up being about the same size when we were trying to get bigger ones and we weren't upgrading very much. And then those were the ones we were trying to like reweigh and try to see uh, which one's weight was the best. How, do you know how many fish you think we caught that day? Um, yeah. Well, we probably called 25. Yeah. Maybe. Nothing that impressive. Probably we, 25. Yeah. yeah. But with, with the brush pile, some of the brush piles that we had, 
there were a couple spots we, we kind of saved for later in the day where it was like, I call them cookie cutter fish, where it was, you just <laughs> like copy and paste. It's like all the fish are about the same size. And we knew that those were good areas to get a good bag that we felt like would be top five and probably top three. But we spent so long, the first three hours in the morning, the last hour and a half of the day, we spent over half the tournament just two fish, but I think those were our two biggest fish. Mm -hmm. We felt like that was the area, I guess the kicker fish, if you will. But then we, we'd said, well, we just need to get a decent bag. And sometimes Chick Lake, it's really a morning bite. And so if you don't catch them the first couple hours, it gets tougher and tougher as the day go, goes on. So when we moved a couple of these other brush piles. There are a couple of brush piles I had that I don't think anybody knew where they were located. And the bite was pretty good when we got to those spots. Yeah. Why do you think it's a morning lake? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I know, uh, my buddy Ryan Smith down in Suffolk, he runs the peanut city crappy club. He's got a trail hmm. there in those lakes. It just seems like the first hour is your best hour. And then your chances of catching fish goes down like 50% every hour it, catching crappy. Is that yeah. something that has to do with the crappy or the lake itself? You think more of, I think it's probably the lake itself. This chick lake kind of has that darker kind of tannin tea yeah. colored to it and Suffolk is pretty similar in that regard, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't quite pinpointed that, but I'm mean, like down at bugs, bugs. It seems like you can catch fish all day long. Interesting. Yeah. I've always been curious about that since I'm getting more and more into crappie fish and like how much they differ from bass just in their behavior. And if it's just more of a, it's a crappie thing compared because if people don't know about chick Lake, it's basically the dammed up version of Chickahominy river. I don't think they pull water there at that dam always. Uh, I think it's pretty kind of st stationary in the water levels, but it is very like swampy, like Florida stain to it. It's almost what I call it, like a Florida stain. So two o'clock rolls around. Was it a particular fish or was it a flurry that really made you start to feel better? Well, oh, long answer to your question is over the years, uh, fishing with Josh has changed a lot. Once upon a time, we used to just cast lines off of a boat and uh, not watch a TV. <laughs> and we didn't have <laughs> as much live scope. We didn't have quite as much knowledge. And Josh's knowledge has been changing over time. So I think in the morning, were we targeting the ladies? Uh, the ladies fish? <laughs> Mostly? Yeah, yeah, targeting the ladies. And uh, they were in different spots then the male fish. And then finally when we moved and we we're like, let's just go check out where we think the, the males are. And we managed to catch some good ones. We even caught, we had had a pre-spawn female. So big belly, you, you know, you'd think she'd be weighing pretty good. And we ended up swapping her for one of the, the new males. And I feel like we were really hoping for a goal weight. Josh kind of studies like what are people getting when they're pre-fishing? Uh, what have we gotten in the years past? And then we worked towards a goal and it was really just finally this, we were getting the cookie cutter fish. I don't think we ended on like a big fish. I think it was literally the cookie cutters just finally upgraded us to the point that we were like, if we hit eight pounds, we'll be feeling pretty good at chick. And then we just got to that point. Finally, we're like, Oh good. We finally hit eight pounds. I feel like we're going to place pretty well. Top three or something like that. So Yeah. That's a I slog. Oof. <laughs> I, I feel like sometimes with, with crappy fishing being a seven fish limit, most tournaments, a lot of times it's your, if you have a kicker fish that goes a long ways, and a lot of time your, your seventh fish will, will pull you back a long ways too. So, you know, I, it's like Bugs Island, for example, we had 12 pounds in March, uh, Jeff and I, and that's almost a pound and three quarter average. And our seventh fish we weighed in was 1.3. It's like, Man, and if we had one more fish that was over a pound and a half, we would have won it. And instead, we came in fourth. It's like, man, we're just such a great average. But then you have that one fish that holds you back. And yeah. so we had a few fish that were holding us back. And then finally, we caught our last fish at two thirty, something like that. And we looked, and it was like our fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh fish were all exactly the same. It's like, okay, we did all we could do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When did you feel like you had it? Was it was it after you weighed in? Was there a certain person that once they weighed in, you felt like, oh, oh my God, we actually got this? To, to me, <laughs> it we weighed in last, and I didn't think we had it until we weighed in last. And actually, our our uh, the bubble scales we had said what seven point nine eight, 
I think, something like that. Yeah. And the second place had 7.98. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so we, like... we didn't know until we put them on the scale, but we were like, well, at least top three. And we definitely knew, didn't think we had big fish and we didn't. Somebody got a 1.5 pounder and our biggest fish was 1.2. So. Wow. Yeah, and our, if you look, our, yeah, our biggest fish was right at that 1.2. And so seven times 1.2 is 8.4 and we had 8.3. Yeah, just so it was like consistent. very consistent fish. Yeah. Uh, the last time we talked about crappie fishing, we we that we really mentioned about the different strategies in which to to catch them. Were you guys using like the long cane poles? Or did you have multiple rods at different depths? Like, how did you go about catching them? I actually got a couple of my rods. Hold on. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, because that oh, is yes. absolutely fantastic. It's kind of impressive how different it is each and every tournament and how he's able to figure it out i like so we've got an acc rod so this is a 13 foot acc rod so it's pretty long that's that's what we were using at lake anna so he says we so (laughs) we were watching the live (laughs) scope we were watching the tv and he was single pulling but i work hard i'm i'm proud to occasionally be the netter in the color and that's important and you know being there to help him and support him and like last week i was catching the big fish that we weighed in and and helping with the finesse aspect of things and he just gives me pointers and we work together and we figure it out and sometimes i get it sometimes he gets it and it's it's good yeah you definitely have to go into the tournament with a team mindset that yes. it's you're working together and you got to figure out what do you need to do to succeed so like Lake Anna, you're targeting individual fish. They're swimming around, they're moving, you're running the boat, the wind's blowing the boat. Um, and you really, when they're doing that, you really only need one person putting the bait in front. And you, your goal is you need to keep your eyes on the screen and you need to be focused. And you stay on the trolling motor. And so Fairydale is really supportive with where she'll net all the fish. She'll cull all the fish. You know, if I need baits, we, we caught a handful of fish. We were using a hair jig, swinging the bait out, putting it in front of them. And if they didn't hit that, then we'd have a real small jig, uh, just a normal jig head, nothing on it, but, but a minnow. And she would pass that to me, and I would cast that out. We caught some fish with that. So it was like two different styles of presentation, um, and she was right there doing everything. So I stayed on the trolling motor the whole time, and that, that tournament was pretty close. And mm-hmm. if she hadn't done all that, we wouldn't have been that successful. And then to flip side of Chick Lake, I'll grab the rod for that one. <laughs> How hard was it for you to get a sense of detecting these bites? Because a lot of times they're very subtle. Oh, can I talk about hook size too? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I, <don't> <laughs> I live in this world <laughs> where I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about fishing <laughs> to other people who fish. <laughs> that, that, that's why we pre-record. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, for this past tournament, it was really tricky. I guess the bite was light what would you say yeah very yeah. much so yeah. yeah and we had teeny tiny little hooks so you had to make sure you waited for the whole the fish to fully commit and that was even hard to tell you had to it would you know tap at the bait tap at the bait and then finally when it pulled we had to do the lightest hook set or else you were going to lose it and then reel it in and uh two pound tests like all of it so fragile in my mind like we're hoping to get big fish or fish up to two pounds maybe not at chick lake but at other places and when he told me it was two pound test i was like you're just asking for me to lose our fish <laughs> you're asking for it that, <laughs> that we were using a 164 ounce jig head yes jesus so, uh, yes at chick lake it was a lot of the fish were we were fishing a lot of like five to seven foot of water um, the majority of it was less than 10 feet we had a few places that were deeper uh, but using such a small jig head where you have to bend the hook out and that was with with these rods. We had two different t- rods that we're using. So this one's the, uh, the TFO. It's actually like a trout fishing rod. Got hmm. from Dances. And then I had another one, uh, a St. Croix rod. Both of these rods have like a lot of really light action. Like is very, that like a very, medium light? So this one here is, I think it's ultra light. Yeah, it's ultra light. Oh, damn. Yeah, so it's it's got like a really, really flimsy tip to it. So a lot of times I'm not real crazy about using these rods, but just like bass fishing, every rod has its place. So when you're using two pound test and one sixty fourth ounce jig head, mm-hmm. you want to have a lot of give to it. So 
these rods actually were perfect for that so that when we would cast that minnow out and you'd, you'd feel the, the, min, the crappy come up, tap the minnow, tap the minnow, and then finally it would grab it and it would start to pull and you just wait until your line looks tight, just like Fred was saying, just ease into it. And then when they're fighting, the rod tip's going crazy. So with the rod tip going crazy, um, you know, as long as you keep tension on them and don't, don't horse it, it's, it's surprising how well you can do. I mean, cause we used to, I think we used that same rod at Lake Anna for our biggest fish. It was like just under two pounds, like a 1.92. Why two pound test versus like four to have a little bit more muscle there? Is it make that big a difference? Probably not, but, uh, <laughs> I follow the pros and, uh, Hayden Jeffries was talking about uh, a lake. He went to, it was really clear. And he said that he was using them a one forty eighth and a one sixty fourth two pound test, and that was the only way he could get the fish to bite. So when we had our classic in October last year, we were having a really tough time getting mm-hmm. the fish to bite. And so I said, let's let's try it. So we tried it there, and we had some success. So now what we'll do most of the time, we'll do the normal fishing that we do six pound six pound test on a shorter rod or eight pound test on a longer rod. And if they don't commit to that or they're acting shy. It's like, we'll just throw all the finesse at them. Like, yeah. why, why would we go like, let's try eight pound, let's try six, let's try four, let's try two. Just go from the normal rod we're going to use all the way to the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. How hard, how hard is it to see that jig on your forward facing sonar? Unless you have like one of those brand new, like 50 inch screens they have, are, are you just not setting it too far out? Like a hundred feet, like bass fishermen do. Yeah. With, with one sixty fourth ounce jig head, you're usually casting it like 20 feet. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah, and it's nice now with this boat that I have, I have power poles on this boat. So, um, we were able to power pole down a couple of the brush piles and so we were able to line up and keep the fish about 20 to 25 feet out. And one key, one pretty, pretty good tip with that, um, is if you just want to cast to the edge, a lot of people, when they pull up to a brush pile, crappy fishing, They'll cast all the way past the brush pile and bring it right over the top of everything. And I've, I've listened to Pat podcasts about bass fishing and they'll say, don't, don't cast to the, all the way to the bank and bring your bait all the way through, like cast to the end of the tree. All right. Work that. Then cast a little bit further in, work that in case there's multiple fish there, you don't want to hook the one against the bank and, and then spook all the rest of the fish. A lot of people don't think about that with crappy fishing. It's the same thing. So when you set up that distance away, make a short cast and see how far that crappy will come out chase that bait and then you can each cast and go further and further i mean jeff poston and i at the bobcats classic we had one spot we caught we weighed in three fish on the first day of the classic from the same spot where we just got really lucky that we were able to pluck them off one at a time or if we just cast it past them and brought it across we probably would have caught one and not gotten the other two just like large so in, in bass the way they react to forward facing sonar it's it the general rule of course there's always exceptions to the rule that you always want to fish up above their head is that the same thing with crappie with the jigs you never want to fish below them i i think so because i've had a handful of times where my line will actually like hit the crappie and then they they say that crappie always feed looking up i don't think that's always true but if you bring the bait right across their nose, if they're really aggressive, they'll hit it. If they're not aggressive, they won't. And the higher you keep it above them, I think it makes it so that they'll see it, they'll chase it, they'll ambush it more likely. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's the secret there. So in general, I would say yes. That's interesting. I agree. Yeah. That's interesting. So it's almost like you want distance because like uh, based on what you just said, so like if it's on their nose, there's a 50, 50 chance they'll do something, but almost like with a cat, if it's farther away where they feel like they're hunting it, you can get more aggression out of them. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to watch the, watch the fish on the live scope because that's kind of what it looks like. Just like a cat that when it's like a foot, foot and a half or two feet above them, you see the crappy kind of get excited and kind of move its tail around and then suddenly like charge for the bait. Versus when it's really close to it, it'll just literally look like it's sniffing it. And it'll yeah. be right in front of its face. And it it won't even take it. Uh, yeah. I spent so yeah. much time this year. This is my second year with Scope. And I spent so much time watching fish in a tournament. It sucks. Like, I started to watch <laughs> betting bass on my Scope. And it's, like, mesmerized about you can see the figure eight pattern they do. Like, almost like a, a deer or a cat with its trail. And it's insane, the fish behavior. You can learn just by watching the stupid thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one thing with with crappy that we've learned. It's if they most of the time a crappy will set up and it'll be 
it'll be sitting like this, like wiggling and getting ready to come up towards it. Um, if you see them like flatter and they're following it like that, unless they take off real fast and hit it, they're usually not interested. They're usually not interested or going flat. If, if they're angled up towards it, there's a much better chance they're going to hit. So people always ask, and I remember last time you had asked about, um, you know, how much time do you give a fish? The thing, since we talked last time that I've started to dial in, if the fish is sitting kind of that vertical presentation and following it and following it, then it swims away. If you put a different presentation, it does the same thing. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Because that fish is setting up like it wants to feed and it's following it. You just don't have the right presentation. You don't have the right speed. You don't have the right jig head. You don't have the right color. You don't have the size, the bait, uh, whatever it may be, the scent. Something's wrong about your presentation. If they're following it flat and then they turn back, just go on to the next fish. That fish isn't doesn't have a feeding like personality yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. 100% agree with that. I, I really do, especially with what I've seen, like at least on Lake Anna and Smith this year. When it comes to bass, though, and this is an interesting comparison, usually, like if you talk to like the Billy Cole, some of the big times guides, like for bass, Tyler Lampole on um, our high pole on Lake Anna, 100 feet, 90, 120, even more. When you said 20 feet and you're staring that cancer ray at them, does that affect them at 20 feet? Do they get anxious? Like, is there a, a sweet spot that you want to hunt them at? I like having them closer to the boat, um, as close to the boat without spooking them. I, I like setting my range at like 25 feet and Jeez. Oof. make, wow, make it like a 20 foot cast or using a 13 foot rod and swing the bait to them. And as long as you're really quiet yeah. with everything you're doing, um, I mean, it, it's crazy how close you can get to crappy. And if you spook crappy, they hear trolling motors all the time. They hear boats coming by. They would normally just swim straight down to the bottom, and they wait about 15, 20 seconds and swim right back up where they were. Now, an exception would be on a brush pile. So when they're on brush piles, I try to be – it's harder to spook them because it seems like they have like a safety net being in that brush pile. But if you spook them off a brush pile, they're in a hurry to get to the next brush pile. Interesting. So they already have like a couple in mind, like, okay, the, the predator's here. So I'm spo like a rabbit almost. Now this is the next one I'm going to go to in my rotation. I don't, huh. I don't think they're that smart that they have a, like, I'm, <laughs> here's the next one I'm going to. They're just like, I'm getting away from this one and I'm going to keep going until I find something safe. Do you have it set at max distance of 20 feet or you'll have it like at, at 40, but I want to fish 20? Uh, it depends. Now I've got the 12 inch screen with the 34 transducer which nice. I think the 34 is a lot better at seeing distance. And so at Lake Anna, we were fishing like five, six foot of water most of the time. It was mind blowing to me that we could see the fish a hundred feet away. Yeah. I mean, just plain and simple. That's a crappy right there. We know it's a crappy, kind of hard to tell how big it is. And then once we get within 60 feet, it was like, that's when we want to target. And then we would ease and we'd slow down and wait till we got within 25 foot to start presenting a bait. But I set it out. Fishing tournaments is all about efficiency. I mean, everybody that enters a tournament can win. Everybody's catching good fish. It's just who can catch catch them in eight hours. So that's what we just try to think the whole time. Well, and that's a good segue to go to Lake Anna tournament. And again, so so for the audience, basically, the chick was the, the the most recent tournament, but they also had another victory, which was before that at Lake Anna. And you mentioned a hundred feet range, and I understand why people want a 30 inch monitor what they're using now because if you're casting a drop shot 100 feet away it's tiny i can't imagine a jig that's smaller than a penny i'm i'm really impressed that we can see it on the screen when we cast 20 feet out you can see it dropping you're like oh there it is there it is and then you can watch it as it comes over the fish so you can figure out your height uh the clarity and technology is it, it's it seems to have changed fishing. It's changed the way he's fished. It's been really entertaining to watch. What lake do you think was harder, Farrah, for, for you? Was it Lake Anna or was it Chick Lake? It's a really good question. Uh, again, Lake Anna, I was more the assistant, which was wonderful. And I feel like we did well together. I, Chick Lake, it was real slow and real <laughs> uncertain. And we do really well together. But every once in a while, the comments were short. <laughs> we finally felt good once it was 2.30. So I'm going to say chick. <laughs> Maybe it was the heat. Yeah, ch chick, 
Chick is a place that's so freaking cool, but I don't know. Like Lake Anna to me would be more my comfort zone because I like to fish. Honestly, I like to fish deeper. Um, jo- Josh, how long did you practice at Lake Anna? Let's see. Aaron Ball and I went up there like three weeks before the tournament. And so last year, the tournament was the beginning of March, I think. And then, so I, this one, no, last year was the end of February. Oh, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So it was, it was around, it was like only, it was less than a month different. So a lot of times when I'm starting a tournament, I'll think about what were the fish doing in years past around the same time. So Aaron Ball and I found some pretty good fish pretty easily based on old patterns. Hmm. So felt pretty good about that. And then I had heard through the grapevine about another part of the lake that it's like, you got to get there. You, there's big fish there. You got to go there. So I spent like four hours in the evening and uh, I went up there and my first fish was like just shy of two pounds. I'm like, this is where we need to go. Then I spent the next three hours and 45 minutes not catching a fish over a pound and a quarter when I knew that we needed a pound and a half, the two pound fish. Um, so I was, I was pretty worried about that one, to be honest. Because, uh, you know, I didn't pre-fish as much. You know, Chick Lake, I pre-fished the day beforehand. So mm-hmm. usually the fish aren't changing that much within one day. That well, makes, that and makes that was a, of the That was a, my next question was, compared to largemouth or smallmouth, where it feels like if you practice three weeks out in the springtime, there's no point because they've changed so much in three weeks, especially in February, March, and April. How much do crappie change from like March in this April time frame? Like was a three weeks out the what you would prefer to do? Or was that just because that's how your schedule allowed it? Definitely a schedule. Um, but one thing I'm starting to hone in on, I don't know if this is fully true, but this is something I'm starting to notice, that when you go from like starting, let's say November, December, the fish seem, crappy seem to like gradually work towards the spawn. It's like, especially Bugs Island. If you, if you fish in December, wherever you find the fish start there in January. And usually the crappie aren't going to be too far away. You go from January to February, same thing. They slowly progress. Then as soon as they spawn, I mean, they're gone. It's like they're doing something completely different. Hmm. I feel like right after they spawn, that's when to me, it feels like they, they disappear on that gradual pattern. And now you got to think, okay, what are post spawn fish doing? I can't, start where I picked up last month. And I knew Lake Anna, for the most part, it was going to be pre-spawn fish. That's what we wanted to target. There were some post-spawn fish, but we felt like the pre-spawn fish that still had eggs were going to be heavier. So I didn't think it was going to change a whole lot in three weeks. It had the potential to, um, but felt pretty comfortable with that aspect. Well, when did you guys start catching them then on Lake Anna? See, pretty much, pretty much right away, just weren't right catching away. the right fish. I mean, right away we were catching small fish. And so we're catching smaller fish right at the start. Now it's like, do we move deeper or do we move shallower? And that was kind of the decision. So one thing we did that was really helpful, Fairdale actually was running the gas motor just idling along. And I just took the live scope and was just sweeping back and forth, looking back and forth until finally we were like, okay, and there's a lot more fish here and these are a little bit bigger and we've moved a little bit shallower. And then it was like, as soon as we caught the first big fish, it was like, okay, this is where they are. But that was, I mean, our first tournament fish was probably what an hour in. Yeah. So. Yeah. With Lake Anna compared to chick, you have like four different types of water clarity on Lake Anna. If you go all the way up and work your way down to the dam and in a perfect world, what type of water clarity do you want to fish? I know you talked to me about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I know he watches for the change in color of the water and maybe fishes the border of where it goes from clean to muddier. So that was actually what we did at, at <laughs> Gaston. At, at Gaston, I generally like the, the dirtiest water possible. I, I think there's a, a couple things that happens there. And the, the main reason is... I'm, sh- I'm sure you've heard of Josh Jones. A little now bit. He's on the, the, the bass side of things. When he started on the crappy side of things, he just told people to find the most nutrients, get as far away from the dam as possible, find the dirtier water. You're more likely to find 
more crappy, bigger crappy. They're going to be more eager to bite. They're going to be less spooked. There's like so many benefits for finding dirtier water. So that gas, and that was one of the things we did. We went, we kept looking for dirty water, kept looking. And so we were working our way up the lake trying to find dirtier water. And then we noticed, I was like, it's clear, clearer and cleaner up here than it was like further down. And so then we started making our way back down the lakes, like right here. This is where it just changed. And then we found one creek that had dirtier water that was feeding into the lake. So like Smith Mountain can be the same way. I fished a tournament a couple weeks there. It's like, I like to fish the, the dirtier water, but everybody has their preferences and their styles. That's really interesting because is usually I think people, when they're thinking like offshore, generally speaking, and not like on the bank, you're going to go clear water. At least that's like where bass fishing has kind of taught me that, but it makes so much more sense that you can fish for them offshore. And especially I've had biologists on the show and what they really brought and enlightened me on this year was, is it clear for them? You know, we get to move to different bodies of water and we see different, like what clear is, but if that fish has lived there its whole life, that might technically be clear water for him. And if they're up Lake where it's always dirty, that might be normal. Yeah. That's one thing too. I wonder when you look at like, okay, what's the visibility here? I've, I've messed around with crappy bringing the bait above their heads. And my thought is that they can see about double what we can see. That's, that's my take on it for like chick Lake. It looked like it was probably two foot of visibility somewhere in that range. And we'd bring the bait four foot above them sometimes and they would turn around and I don't know if they, felt it coming by, but we're talking about a 164th ounce jig head with a minnow. I don't know how much they're noticing that coming by or if they're able to see it, but I think they can see and sense substantially better than we can. I hundred, I hundred percent agree with that. I really do. What was the big turning point in your day at Lake Anna? I, <laughs> I, I would say like an hour into the tournament when we caught our first, cause we were looking, it was like, we weren't really sh sure. We were trying to decide to go to option A or option B and they were pretty far apart. And I really didn't want to waste time. And so we'd been finding some fish. It's like, you know, I fish with some buddies that, that fish a lot of bass tournaments. And they're always like, just get a limit and then we'll upgrade. But to me, it's like, if you need a pound and a half crappy, I'd rather have one pound and a half fish, you know, than three one pound fish. Cause I feel like you don't want any of those fish, you know, you're c competing to, to be in the top. So after like an hour, when we finally saw it was like, that's a tournament fish. And there's actually three together. When we saw three fish that were tournament fish in the same area. I mean, it was like rapid fire. It was, that was like, as soon as we saw them, it was like, okay, now we, we know what we're doing. You execute fantastic as a group you're able to get these fish into the boat and you win this one that was your first win together this year correct at lake anna cool so when we go to the chick how much of that was like no way we just did this back-to-back -back wins like that's got to be like insane an insane feeling to have so the the first tournament so we had a we had some boat issues, so we had yeah. to disqualify oh, ourselves shit. from our own tournament. Yeah. So because we got back, we got back late. So it was like, and we have a points race, and there's there's only five tournaments in the regular season, and you drop your worst finish. So what we do is, if you don't weigh in any fish, or if you pay your entry and don't show up, or in this instance, we got back late. It's like, well, we get last place points. We have a points race, so it's like, well, we can't mess up now. That's it. So. We knew it was going to be pretty tough, especially the anglers are getting significantly better. Yeah. And a lot of us in the, in the club fish together. And so I, I'm an open book. I share, we sh I share a lot of tips and stuff. With it's annoying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually, I mean, I actually pre fish like Saturday afternoon with, with one of the guys that was in the tournament. Um, you know, so, um, I don't know. We were just really hoping it's like, all right, we really want to do well. We won the points last year. It'd be awesome to do it again, but especially after the first tournament, the chances are, are low. Yeah. More people coming out fishing, more competition. Everybody's getting better. We work on getting better every year, but the rest of the competition is getting better every year. It's been fun to watch, but you know, we're competitive too. So 
it's also how, scary. how much does that change the dynamic though where it's your club like it's not just like it's some random club where you can check in and check out mentally it's you bring this home with you if somebody bitches they're writing you the email after the tournament that's got to be stressful it's it's a fun group and yeah. my whole focus on this it's just to have fun and to, to get more people interested in crappy fishing, grow the sport. I don't want it to be too serious. I've had folks ask me about raising the entry fee or doing, changing the rules to make things like more competitive and more serious. And there's other trails that are, that are more serious. The point of this club is for people to get together and have fun. And we have a handful of folks that come out that have never crappy fished before. They want to learn and it's very welcoming and inviting. And I think that's why the club's the club is growing so much and it's continued to, to grow. And we just have such a fun group. It, and yeah, even the top three after each tournament, they share the top three teams share, you know, ways that they caught their fish and how they caught their fish. Like it's not supposed to be all all secrets and you know, it is before the tournament, but less so after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean when I when I got my first boat and that was twenty seventeen. And I, I wanted to learn about fish in public bodies of water. And so I, I joined a bass club and at the weigh-in, they would share a little bit of information about how they caught their fish. And then I found out later that several of them were lying. And, and that really disappointed me, frustrated me. Um, like I get it during the tournament, before the tournament, but it's like at the weigh-in when it's supposed to be an inviting club. And so that, I don't know, to me, it was like, all right, I want to have a welcoming environment where people yeah. can get to get better and have fun together and go on trips and it, yeah. it is such a i go down this rabbit hole all the time with talking um i had chaz on the show back in march at Cur talking about Kerr, and we were talking about that elite athletic mindset and it's so interesting whether it's this or when i was coaching baseball and teaching you know parents how to be coaches they treat thursday nighters or your, or your tuesday night bowling club like it's the championship and it's like but it's not I mean, and you're a dick. <laughs> I mean, it does. It, it's so weird how people try to put all this thing on, like you said, like this club is meant for this or Little League is meant for this, but we blow it up out of proportion. It's such a weird human condition. Yes, it, we are lucky that. So in the bike world, there's road racing and there's like dirt riding, like mountain biking or cyclocross. And the road racers are more type A. And the mountain bikers and cyclocross are more type B, fun, huh. you know, making friends, things like that. The crappy bass world is kind of the same. <laughs> uh, the bass world is maybe a little bit more type A and a little bit more like the road racers. And then the, the crappy world is a little bit more like, let's be friends, let's have a nice time and let's catch some awesome fish and share some details. So it's been nice and I feel like a little bit easier going mm -hmm. than maybe if we started like a, a bass club. Or something like that but crappy is josh's passion and that's what we enjoyed enjoy you know fishing for and it's been nice that it brought a good community and a very very friendly individuals that we like to see every month if not more than every month yeah yeah, yeah there's there's definitely with the bass side and the crappy side there's there's a broad spectrum of fishermen in yeah. in both for yeah, sure that's true for sure so it's uh to, to yeah. finish it off then from the club standpoint, do you have like a number at which you want to cap it? Or is that a problem you want to deal with, you know, in the, that's for future you to figure out, like whether it's a hundred or 200 or, or whatever. I, that'd be awesome if that was a problem. But the biggest thing is I'd say is that we want to grow it. I say organically, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but I, I want the type of people that like to share information and have fun and like the, the, the group that we have right now, I want to keep that same mindset, keep that going. Um, so I, that'd be great if we ended up having a problem. Yeah. It's just interesting. Like I, now that I have so many clubs I talk to and it's interesting where they're like, I started out with five and now we have 50 and it's like, holy crap. And it, it, it almost becomes a job. It's, it's funny. Like, and it's not there yet with you, but it's like when you do something good and have a good product, people want to go to it. Um, but to, to get off the, the political side of the fishing club uh, and just some just basic stuff, if you want to get into crappie fishing and not just be minnows, 
Um, what is the, is there a starter kit at Bass Pro Shop you can buy? Is it better to go just get a couple of niche bases? Like how would you get somebody that, that is, this will trigger people in the comment section, just minnow and bobber, and they want to go to that next level. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I would start at dance is sport and goods. Awesome. I, I really like the people there. I work with them quite a bit. Um, Walter, and Steve and Chase and everybody else that's there at the store. So it's the difference I see there is if you go in there and you talk to them in the store, like they will point and just tell them, say, Hey, like I, I heard Josh on uh, the DMV podcast, you know, and if you tell them, say, what does Josh get when he comes in here? If you do that, <laughs> they will point, they will walk around and say, well, Josh usually buys this and he usually buys this and they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. And then I'd say coming out to one of the tournaments coming out at Lake Ann, it was awesome. There was, there was one boat that came in particular and I said, I started asking them some questions. I hadn't seen them before. And they said, yes. And we haven't caught a single fish out here. We've been fishing multiple days, but we're here because we want to learn. I'm like, well, you came to the right spot. Yeah. So that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And then, and then guys, as always, when I do this link in the episode description. So if you want to just, you know, join their Facebook group, ask some questions. A uh, lot. The first, the first show we did together at the Richmond Fishing Expo, there were a lot of people that came up to me afterwards, and we're just talking about like what type of baits we should get and rods. So, I, definitely a fascinating subcategory of fishing that you can absolutely burn all of your life saving <laughs> savings in. What do you guys have coming up next? Yes, yeah, so we got the got the James River. That's the next tournament. Yeah, so the James River is in a, a couple weeks, two and a half weeks. And I was just thinking about it. So we live here on the James River, and this is, I think, the only place. Smith Mountain Lake came in second in a crappy tournament. Other than that, I think it's the only lake that we haven't won a crappy tournament. It's in hmm. our backyard, so it's kind of it's kind of frustrating. But <laughs> um, that's what's next is uh, the James River. And then after that, we got Lake Chesda next month. Why do you think that is? Why do you have the yips on the James? So I, th I think what it is, is a lot of these tournaments, it's like, I, I narrow it down where it's like, I, it's pretty easy for me to ignore the, the small fish, the half pound fish. And I just keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. The James river has so many quality fish. It's like, pound and a quarter, pound and a third, 1.4, 1.2. It's like a lot of the fish are so close and they're everywhere. It's hard for me to narrow down and say, no, this isn't a good area because it only has pound and a quarter and this area over here has pound and a half. So I'm hoping that we can overcome that hurdle. But when there's so many quality fish at so many different places, it's, it's hard to narrow down the water. Well, we'll probably have both of you on again when you guys win that one as well. Uh, uh, Faradale, do you have another, uh, uh, cycling competition coming up? Just name a weekend. I'll be racing a <laughs> bike. Uh, I'll be in Maryland this weekend. And then, uh, over towards like, uh, the mountains and Buena Vista the weekend after. And then after that we'll be in Wilmington, Delaware. Never. Been. Are you sponsored? Like how is I this am, an organization? I am on a team, am on a team and they, they pay for my registration and my travel. Yeah, it's re it's pretty cool. Is this an organ? Is, is this like a series or are these all unique one events? <laughs> uh, all unique events. Hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really I, cool. She wouldn't say so, but I say she's a professional cyclist because if you have somebody that covers your costs and your entry fees, you're a professional for, for traveling. That's, I mean, that's what every fisherman wants. But in the cycling world, I don't get paid where I don't have to work anymore. So I'm not a professional cyclist. Neither are most fishermen, honestly. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most fishermen are happy if they get, you know, 20% off of the tackle store. Yeah. You true. know, that's, that's semi pro there. It's like, yeah. if I had somebody that was paying me to go fish a tournament out of state and cover my costs, that's, that's a professional fisherman. <laughs> so she's a professional cyclist. Is there like uh, Olympics or Pan Am games? Is there like a next tier to that? Oh yeah, there's there's like national competitions for basically any category of biking, whether it's like gravel racing or cyclocross or road racing. Uh, you can win national titles, so that's kind of cool. 
Well, Josh, now you have to go over there and, and run one of those races. That'd be fantastic content. <laughs> he comes and supports me. I think that's yeah, somebody enough. has to cheer. <laughs> Apparently it's exhausting just spectating from what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, I, I really can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, is there anything that we forgot to cover or anything that you'd like to promote or plug? Yeah, just check out the Facebook page, Richmond Crappy Club, and ask your questions there and join us for our next tournament on the James. Yeah, yeah. I could, couldn't say any better. Yeah, just give me a call or send me a message. I love talking fishing all the time. Yes. I drive for work a lot. I'm on the phone all the time talking fishing with somebody yes. or listening listening to a podcast. Um, yeah, and then... Uh, Dance of Sporting Goods. Dance of Sporting Goods helps me out. So uh, I always uh, appreciate it when people swing by there and support them. Mm -hmm. Guys, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. If you'd like to check us out on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or Amazon Music, if you'd like, you know, support us on Patreon. If it wasn't for my Patreon supporters, this show would not be able to happen. Like, and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.